Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Andre, and I will present some of the work we do at Digital Building Technologies at ETH Zurich. This is the chair of uh, Professor Benjamin Dillenberger, and this particular project concerns uh, 3D printed formwork for bespoke concrete stairs. So I will start a bit. My background is in architecture, so it's uh, a little bit different to most of the people here. And uh, this is an image from a few years ago. This is my master's thesis, and already maybe six years ago, um, I became very intrigued by the gap that was existing between the um, uh, unlimited freedom we have in a digital design environment where we can even make things that we um, cannot imagine and uh, some very strict fabrication limitations uh, that concern what we can physically uh, actually produce. And um, bridging this gap between the digital and the physical is one of the main focuses of the work that we carry on at uh, DBT. So this is a, a project from a couple of years ago. It was a commission from the Saint Pompidou for a four by four meter uh, art installation, let's say. Uh, and this pushes the boundaries of what we conventionally assume can be fabricated at uh, large scale. So this is, we're looking into real architectural applications. Um, however, the materials that we have access to generally through 3D printing are not directly suitable for architecture. This is for, um, different considerations, so either uh, long-term uh, fire safety, health and safety, uh, structural properties, and so on. So this is why we're interested in still using 3D printing for architecture, but looking into a more conventional, um, well-established material, which is uh, concrete, because concrete is the most used material in the world. Um, so I think actually it's second only to water, so it's, let's say, the, the um, uh, most used synthetic material in the world. Um, it's for good reason, so it's a um, very sustainable material, it's very versatile. Um, however, um, we're using concrete not in a very smart way. So uh, I think statistically, also before it was as, um, maybe I go back, I forgot to mention this. Um, as statistically now China every three years uses more concrete than the United States has used in the entire 20th century. Um, so in other words, we're building a new Paris every week. And the question we're asking uh, is, how do we want this new Paris to look like? Uh, and this is because we're confronted with this kind of image uh, more and more often, where concrete is used in a very repetitive, very standardized, inefficient, prefabricated monolithic boxes. And this is despite the fact that concrete can actually be cast into any conceivable shape. Um, so because we, my talk is uh, supposed to focus a lot on stairs, we have the same issue with uh, stairs. So this is, I think, the first uh, public concrete stair that was built in the um, uh, Galerie Lafayette in Paris uh, about 100 years ago. And you see it's a very expressive, it's uh, celebrated, it's a representative feature of the space. Uh, and yet nowadays, uh, I have actually, it's uh, maybe um, a couple of decades ago, these are two main buildings of ETH. Uh, so I'm kind of confronted with this image uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and you see a lot of, the, of this uh, expressive um, uh, uh, property of concrete is lost here, so architectural language now relies a lot on materiality and less on uh, shape and geometric expression. Um, so why this limitation? I think you've seen this already in the uh, previous presentation. This mostly comes from our uh, limitation in what, we, what kind of formworks we can fabricate to produce these expressive concrete shapes. Um, so on the one hand side, we're, for economic reasons, we're relying a lot on um, uh, standardized flat panel formwork systems. These might be uh, timber, uh, steel, plastic, and so on. And even for these standardized systems where we're trying to make a concrete box, for example, the cost for formwork can account for up to 50% of the entire cost of the, of the concrete box. And if you think about stairs, which are intrinsically, intrinsically uh, relatively complex uh, shapes, and some stairs might be uh, even more complex when you, we think about um, helical stairs and so on. Uh, in this case, the former can account for up to 80%. So this is more than uh, labor, uh, reinforcement, raw material, cement, and so on combined. It's actually four times more than all these other things combined. And this is only the cost for the former. We're still relying on flat panels. So um, we don't really have all the freedom we want. We have to approximate the shapes and so on. So our solution here is not to bypass the need for formwork altogether, like you've seen um, with these um, great projects with the robots 3D printing directly concrete, is to uh, actually give us more freedom uh, for fabricating uh, formworks. 
Uh, and what we do, we actually 3D print the formwork. So what you see on the outside here, this darker layer is a 3D printed formwork and we cast concrete inside. So we rely structurally on the concrete, but we inherit all the geometric freedom from the 3D printed formwork. So we did, we've explored this idea in several projects before. Um, this is a smart slab. It was a part of um, uh, a larger effort to combine digital fabrication into a functional building. Um, it's about 80 square meters, and uh, here we use some computational optimization uh, processes. You've seen some already in um, uh, Sylvan's presentation and in the one before, I think. Um, so we manage, because of the geometric freedom we have now, to uh, reduce the weight of a standard comp concrete component by 50 to up to 70 percent. And not only this, um, as architects, of course, we're always excited about the uh, geometric freedom that we have, and um, uh, 3D printed formworks allow us to do this. So we can have these uh, sharp edges, um, uh, great details, undercuts, microstructures, which are maybe a few millimeters inside. Uh, this is, I don't know, a uh, 16th of an inch, or I don't know how to translate this. Uh, and of course, the great thing is that we cannot actually achieve this with any other um, uh, fabrication process uh, known that's accessible to concrete. Uh, there's a tiny problem, of course. Um, this uh, uh, process that I showed, binder jetting, uses uh, sandstone, uh, and it's, uh, it produces very heavy formwork. So it uses a lot of material. I think for the smart slab, there were about 100, 120 kilos per square meter of material, which basically becomes waste because uh, it's a unique shape. You don't get a chance to reuse it. It's a one-of-a-kind thing. So recyclability is possible, but a bit questionable at this point in time. So <clears throat> what we want to, the way we address this is to use a um, different 3D printing process, um, which is uh, based on plastic. And the unique great thing about this is that we can actually make uh, stable shells, which are less than a millimeter in thickness. So now actually we reduce the uh, specific weight of the formwork from 120 kilos to about four kilograms per square meter of um, concrete component. So what you see here is the a formwork for the very first little prototype that we made, uh, which is this one here. And you see we still have a lot of um, accuracy in the details. These are about uh, half a millimeter uh, wide little prisms. So we inherit very well the geometric complexity. Also topologically, we have a little bit more freedom or let's say uh, access to a different language than we have with binder jetting. So we can um, uh, produce these kind of complex uh, objects. Uh, and of course, we want to do a, a version of the smart slab, but this time with um, a plastic binder jet 3D printing, which I think hopefully will be built at the end of this year. Um, so again, we're excited, architects, designers, about this because we, we can have uh, this radically new aesthetic available directly to concrete where we can do some fusion of uh, digital architecture and gothic architecture and uh, some HR Giga or whatnot, stuff that we could only design before, but now we can actually uh, also fabricate this. Um, again, I come to the tiny problem, which uh, as you've seen before, it turns out to be quite heavy. Uh, and this time, uh, the problem is that we reduce the material so much, so we only have these uh, millimeter thick uh, shells, which means that um, the process is no longer uh, very uh, um, feasible to be ac applicable for in-situ uh, concrete casting. So the, the formworks are so fragile and we are dealing with a lot of unpredictability uh, related to uh, transportation, handling on site. Also, you have to imagine that these um, uh, super thin shells have to take tons of concrete, so uh, five, seven, ten tons of concrete that only rest on a, on a very thin, um, uh, plastic shell. Uh, so this is something we cannot afford. So to avoid this risk, rather than um, uh, using the system for casting on site, we want to use it for uh, discrete assemblies of smaller prefabricated parts. And uh, naturally a great application for this is uh, to use it for stairs, fabricated as discrete assemblies of parts, of parts which consist of uh, a stringer with the attached um, uh, cantilevering step and the balustrade. Um, these are parts that uh, are small enough so they can be handled by two people on site. So let's say they are uh, under 70 kilograms uh, uh, in weight. And assembly on site can be done with uh, post-tensioning. Um, 
So uh, here I go back to this uh, idea that I showed before that we use a lot of concrete. We have these um, uh, boxes that we always design. But actually, for structural reasons, we only need uh, about 30% of the material, or maybe 40%. Uh, and everything else is there just because uh, it's much cheaper to make a piece of formwork that's flat rather than to create these complex shapes. So that's where 3D printing comes in place. And I have, again, I'm not going to go through topology optimization. I've seen it uh, a few times before. Maybe I can just mention um, these numbers that in the, in the case of um, uh, constructions, we've done some experiments. And what would normally look like this, like a, a solid box for a two square meter concrete slab, uh, can actually with 3D printed formwork look like this. So we're saving, again, in this case, I think 65% of the, of the weight. Um, so now we're applying the same principles for stairs. So we ran this uh, studio project with uh, master students for two years. Uh, in the first year, we looked at uh, using uh, topology optimization directly. Uh, and this is a, a, a stair. This is the underside of the stair. So it's an object that I think one meter by about 30 centimeters. So that's a pretty standard side, size for um, uh, a public staircase. Um, and this uh, contains uh, a hierarchy of tubes. So the main tubes actually contain the post-tensioning tendons. And everything is there to distribute the loads uh, and to also stiffen the entire, the entire system. Um, so this was the first experiment. The next year we did um, a, a similar exercise with different uh, students. And this time we focused more on the fabrication uh, and uh, figuring out all the details how to make this possible. And in this case, we also looked at two steps and how these come together and how they are connected. Um, so this is how the formwork for one of these steps would look like. Um, because they are uh, slightly bigger than our biggest printer, they had to be discretized. So again, this is an object that's about 1.1, 1.2 meters by 35 centimeters. Um, it's discretized to fit the, the printing volume. And then it's assembled, it's put together with a chemical welding process. And the pipes that you see here that look like a, a life support system are actually uh, functional pipes for us to, it's basically a, a thicker inlet for concrete, uh, which uh, feeds to the bottom of the step. And there are some smaller outlets which allow the air to go out. So this is a self-compacting concrete. As you cast it, it doesn't need vibration, but air bubbles come up. And whenever we have a high point in the formwork, um, there is a little uh, tube that allows the air to go out so that we, allow, we avoid the blowholes on the, on the surface. Um, so we have a lot of uh, great advantages with 3D printed formwork. Uh, especially for stairs, we can integrate um, the fabrication of functional details. Uh, such as anti-slip surfaces, which would uh, normally uh, be required by law to have in public staircases. And also, uh, staircases have uh, a series of different parts, balustrades, handrails, risers, treads, um, nosings, and so on, uh, which normally come with their own um, supply chain. And because we can now integrate the fabrication and have everything in concrete with a single piece of formwork, we can avoid all this... Um, uh, construction nightmare, which can, come, which can come from all these mechanical fixings and so on. Um, I talked before about uh, topology optimization. In the case of stairs, it's quite interesting because we can optimize the concrete, which is actually not... Concrete in itself, it's um, isotropic, but because it contains reinforcement, it behaves a bit differently. Um, and here, we can also optimize the shape of the uh, of the reinforcement. And because we use uh, flexible reinforcement, so th these are post-tensioning tendons, we can actually fabricate uh, the housing of a very precise enclosure, uh, basically a spatially uh, curved um, uh, 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 tendon that optimally responds to the load case of the step. So again, this is fabricated uh, in the same step with the outer shell of the formwork and it's highly optimized. So here we also integrate a lot of um, um, smart assembly and smart construction details. So even small things like labeling, because if you think about uh, all these parts that need to come together, um, it helps a lot if you have a good uh, referencing systems, but also things like uh, ceiling gaskets and other types of uh, assembly details. Um, so now we're working on uh, fabricating an entire stair. So we did the uh, first year was uh, one step. The next year we did two. Now we're looking into making a, a, a bigger version, a uh, fully functional stair. We have a few de design options. I'm sorry, my voice is going away. I think... Uh, 
I'm not very used to the air conditioning here. Um, so we've got a few design options. Uh, and actually, I showed this image of the smart slab, and I want to go back to it because this is what uh, inspired us in the first place. Uh, as I mentioned, everything there is um, uh, designed and built with this um, uh, crazy digital fabrication process. Like we have smart dynamic casting and robots assembling uh, timber pieces. But the stair is still a bit uh, conservative. So we thought we can maybe uh, replace it or put something uh, a bit different there. And um, I come to the conclusion now, and I want to um, um, have a bit of a broader um, view on this. Um, and I think I can connect this to uh, the keynote that you saw yesterday from Stefana Pasco. Um, and I want to refer to a report from McKinsey, which says that uh, agriculture and construction are actually the least digitized uh, industry sectors. And at the same time, uh, the construction industry is responsible for 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So a bigger question for us is what do we do about this? How can we use uh, digitization to make the building site smarter and to enable us to use uh, more efficiently um, uh, sustainable building uh, techniques? So with this, I thank you very much and I welcome any questions. <coughs>